and welcome once again to What Saith the Scripture. I'm Brant Stubblefield. I'm Madison Wilbanks. And I'm Caleb Griffin. And we're excited that you've chosen to join us this evening for an excellent topic that we're going to be discuss discussing concerning raising godly men in the Lord's church. Madison, it is the case today that we're suffering from a lack of godly men in the church of Christ. Mm -hmm. We really need to raise up more young men to be faithful, to be masculine, and to pursue biblical manhood. Mm -hmm. What are some thoughts that, that you're thinking as we approach this subject this evening? Well, one of the first things that I think of, it, I go to Proverbs <clears throat> in chapter one, and I think of how many men, especially are running around, uh, whether it be through occupation, whether it be through their spousal choice, uh, whether it be where they worship, I don't think they have a healthy fear of the Lord. And I think that's where it begins because that's where we find wisdom, especially when we talk about things of biblical nature. Amen. You know, the Ecclesiastes writer said that the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. So you're right. Having that proper perspective of God is going to initiate a fire within us to serve him. And if you all notice, Madison laid out basically our points this evening. Um, Caleb and I and, and Madison, we, we talked beforehand and we have come up with four basic reasons that the Bible teaches that men are being lost in the shuffle in this world. And so we have who we marry, the choice of our occupation, our friends and acquaintances, and the congregation of which we choose to identify with and hold membership in. Those four areas of our life are going to be very key. Now, we're assuming a young man's already been raised up and nurtured and admonished right. the Lord, Ephesians 6. But then when that young man begins to develop and move into manhood, and transitioning to his own family, all of these four points are very relevant and they're crucial. Before we begin this evening, it's always customary that we go to our Father in prayer. Our Holy Father, we are indeed grateful this evening to be your children and to have the opportunity on this broadcast to put forth your word. And Father, we ask a special blessing this evening on all the young men that are watching the broadcast. And we pray, Father, for a very fruitful discussion that we can have some impact in the lives of young men, that we would be able to inspire them to lead lives of holiness, lead lives of dedication, that they'll be able to make clear decisions concerning their job, who they marry, their friends and their acquaintances, and the congregation of which they hold membership in. And Father, this is our prayer in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. 
So Caleb, as we start this evening and we go through these, cru- these crucial decision points in life, again, we're talking about young men who've been raised, most likely already attending the Churches of Christ, right? right. Their parents have brought them along. They've been taught by Bible class teachers un- under preaching and so forth. And, you know, at some point, they obeyed the gospel, baptized in Christ. Maybe Let's take an example. Maybe a young man, 17, 18, 19 years old. But now he's about to enter into, you know, the transition period of life, as I call it. He's moving on to college, possibly. He's moving on to, to job and occupation. He's thinking about maybe getting married, the future, and, and he's moving away from home. Maybe he's going to have to find a place to worship. And so which one of these would you like to begin with this evening that are so crucial to a young man staying faithful in this transition time period? Sure. I thought about some verses relating to uh, a job that uh, someone should hold. Okay. That was one big area for me after college, kind of the scenario you're talking about. And I thought about 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, uh, where it says, Even when we were with you, uh, we gave you this rule, if a man will not work, he shall not eat. So we have precedence that work is required in order to um, take care of ourselves, take care of others as we start a family, Yes, uh, wives and children. But I also thought of 1 Corinthians 16, we're obligated to give, and without funds, how can I give to the church? How can I be a proper example of working to contribute to the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. Those are great points, uh, Caleb. Just out of curiosity, what type of, what line of work do you do, Caleb? I am in the systems engineering uh, line of work, kind of aviation. Okay. So. Is it a pretty challenging career? It is, but it's worth it, and it allows me to contribute uh, to the church here at Deer Creek. Right. Do you feel like that your career that, that you chose, what advantages does it give you as a Christian? I mean, is the environment such that it's, you know, that, that you can serve God, or is it really hard to be a Christian at the place where you work? It can be difficult to be a Christian there, but it's also given me opportunity to speak with others who aren't in the same uh, group as myself. I've met people from the Catholic Church, from Baptist Church, from United Church of Christ, um, very many other denominations. And so being able to have those conversations right. and understand others as well as maybe um, yeah. bring some of my own points to light. It's a great place to start and evangelism right. and so forth. But the reason I bring that up, um, Madison, you know, you and, I've talked before, you and I both have talked before that you know, some occupations are just seemingly difficult. It's, I'm not saying it's wrong, but they just bring a certain set of challenges to the table. Mm-hmm. And a young man that's not grounded in the faith, during this transition period, during his first move away from home, he gets his first job. If he's not really grounded, Satan can even through the job, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Easily. Lead people astray. So give us some thoughts on that, Madison. Yeah, um, I come from more of a construction background. Okay. <clears throat> maybe more of your labor um, intensive environments. And usually what I found in, is that is a very challenging environment. Not to say that Caleb's isn't. Um, it most certainly can be. But when you find yourself in a particular environment, especially as a young man, you are going to be pressed. You're going to yes. be challenged. You're going to be um, ridiculed. They're, they're, they're going to try to find any and every way they can to maybe see if you are what you say you are, to really make you... Test you. Exactly. You know... I grew up in farm country and a lot of oil field hands and so forth. And, and you're right, you know, very physical, brute masculinity, mm-hmm. right? But it takes more than muscles to be a man. Mm-hmm. And sometimes on those type of job sites, the mouth would get pretty vulgar, mm-hmm. you know, and there'd be, right. you know, pretty, eh, there'd be racist jokes and, and there would be sexual innuendos and, you know, degrading of women through, you know, through discussion. And what I want young men out here to see this evening uh, is, is that number one, those things are not acceptable in God's sight. Number two, we have to be cautious as Christians because sometimes we, we get ourselves in an environment where we think of our career as more important than our Christianity. And ultimately, if we're going to prioritize properly, our relationship with Christ precedes everything. So not saying any of those jobs are wrong necessarily, but we have to be cautious, mm-hmm. right? 
And what we have to make sure is if any time during this move towards adulthood, especially, and all throughout the rest of our life, if we see ourselves slipping and we're not able to maintain our Christianity, it's time to immediately refocus that job and that career path because your job is not more important than your soul. I thought about while you were saying that I used to work a bunch of overtime. Okay. And while that's not bad, it means more money. Um, it distracts me from other things that I should prioritize above my career. Um, even if I had a family, it could distract me from them. It could distract me from uh, even reading my Bible, right? Something sure. so simple, all for the sake of more money, or I think I'm doing a good job um, when I'm really not prioritizing. One thing that came to mind with what you just said was, you know, is Christian men, we're called to be good stewards on this earth, whether that be our talents, whether that be mm -hmm. our finances, whether that be the souls that God's charged, uh, should we choose to take a, a spouse or children, et cetera. So we have to put all these things into perspective when we really try to analyze our life and say, is this pleasing to God? Am I being a good steward of God's money? Am I being able to be benevolent? Am I able to take care of the mouths that I've chose to have and, and be a, a godly man and a godly father to both my spouse and children should we choose to uh, take those endeavors on in life? Amen. And, and that's why this job, you know, we can't hardly emphasize enough. You know, we could talk about this just in a whole hour, mm -hmm. just this part, right? Yep. Because when I, let's say that, that you choose to marry, you know, both of y'all are single, right? And let's say y'all choose to marry someday, okay? And you're right. You take upon a wife to take care of and children, well, that means you're going to have to have a job and a career, but at the same time, you don't want that job and career to hinder your wife and children's souls, right? You want that job to enhance your ability to provide and, and to, with freedom and, and, and through security, offer your family the physical things, but only after you have provided for the spiritual things. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we can't keep going back that the job must be underneath the larger banner of Christianity, which demands that we prioritize and, and God's first above everything. You know, and I was thinking, especially for some of these young men out there um, who might be looking at occupations or preparing for college, university, or whatever path you're on, I would highly advise you to seek a godly mentor to mimic, whether that may, that may not be the profession you want to go down, but look at men who are modeling what the scriptures say. They, they're already falling in line with what God's asked them to do. And so I think that really puts you in a very effective position going into any Amen. type of occupational environment. Man, you, you brought up something. My mind just went in a whole different direction, but that's you know kind of how I am anyways. But when we look at the qualifications of elders, and if you're watching tonight and you're not a member of the Church of Christ, elders are those men that are qualified per 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1 who are faithful in all things. And no doubt God set men in the church to lead that you said that we can look up to, right, that have set standards of excellence of, hey, mm -hmm. this is what it means to be a committed husband. This is what it means to be a faithful man of God and to have his children respect him and, and you know, so forth. And so when we have that type of model in Scripture, there's a reason why God set these men in the church, the local congregation, to serve is that standard of excellence? Well, these men have these men have a track record of consistency. Yes, over a long period of right. time, so we know they're not fickle. And as First Timothy states, uh, temperament. They have a good, solid temperament, and that's a man you can trust. Not a novice, not a beginner, right? Mm -hmm. They've they have completed a great portion of their life already, mm -hmm. and that completion, like the word you use, is consistency. Mm -hmm. Caleb, is there another thought we had tonight besides job that we was going to discuss? I think we were talking about uh, the people you associate with, your friends, your acquaintances. Um, I thought of Proverbs chapter 1, okay, verse 10. It says, My son of sinners entice you, do not give in to them. Right? Proverbs has plenty of verses about using wisdom to choose who you're around, who you associate with. Um, the totally actions agree. that you take. Totally agree. You know, I never realized it when I was younger, but it works both ways. Not only do I have to make sure that I'm not placing myself around people that will destroy my faith, 1 Corinthians 15, 33 talks about that, 
But then I also have to make sure that I'm not that person Mm -hmm. that's destroying somebody else's faith. I want to be the Jonathan to David. Mm -hmm. You know, 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 3, I quoted earlier that, um, that, that he said, look, their souls were knit together as one. We want to be that person, right, that assists somebody else, and we want to be that Paul for a Timothy, that mentor, that guide. And the last thing we need in our life is to be surrounded by a bunch of people that are dragging us away from God. I think some people think that Satan's going to come in, you know, he's going to be in some little uh, red suit with horns and a little tail, and and they have characterized him as a cartoon, Mm -hmm. which almost makes him as if he's fictional. Right, right. We're not dealing with... A Bugs Bunny. We're not dealing with some magical cartoon fairy tale. We're dealing with a real entity that has a specific person, and he's coming after your soul. And I've noticed this, Madison and Caleb. So many of my young friends that I grew up with that were raised, quote, in the congregation of the Churches of Christ are no longer faithful anymore. And it's not because they made any one specific thing, you know. It's because they made a series of choices that really did not put God first. So we can't just preach Matthew's... uh, 633, seek the kingdom first, without practically, mm-hmm. with pragmatism, pointing out how you actually accomplish that. And one of those ways is, is hey, my job is not as important as my Christianity. Mm-hmm. My job should serve my commitment to Christ. Mm-hmm. And then the second one is, you're right. I've got to watch who I place my, my intimacy with. Mm-hmm. And if I place my heart and soul and in all my time and all of my efforts around people that are trying to destroy my faith, then I may not be long. I may not be long in Christ Jesus. I, I may drift back in the world. You know, I've, I was thinking about this. I forgot what series we were doing the other week, um, but I was just thinking. I've never seen somebody's life enhanced by going into the world and choosing drugs, <laughs> uh, premarital sex, um, alcoholism. I know we have a couple here who we've tragically seen deal with this. And yes, it's been very right. painful to watch and. You know, we're most certainly uh, side by side with them, but I've ne- I've never seen somebody choose that path in life and be better. And I and, and to counter that point, I've never seen somebody choose Christ or the Scriptures and following you know them thereof. And I've not seen their life enhanced. Amen. I've always seen the Lord when people choose to follow Him, per what the Scriptures say. Never have I not seen a life enhanced or be better off, better off. No doubt. One of the. Uh, verses brought up on a uh, previous broadcast was the Ethiopian eunuch, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. He went on his way rejoicing. His life was better because of the choice he made to follow uh, what was preached to him. So, yes. I agree. And think about even Jesus himself, if you're watching at home this evening. Jesus himself surrounded him uh, himself with men of integrity, men who he had called to train, And that inner circle of Peter, James, and John, they were there consistently Mm -hmm. throughout his ministry. And even though there was a time which Peter waffled, the large large scale view of it was these men were there beside him Mm -hmm. uh, on almost every step of the way. Yes. You know, and I I was thinking, and also in Proverbs when you mentioned that it gives us, as you said, Brant, pragmatism to when we're kind of unsure in ourselves, maybe we don't have that, that sound counsel always around us, we can always retreat to some of the more pragmatic portions of Scripture yes. and really seek to see what God says about the matter because there's a lot of just everyday, everyday practicality in Proverbs that you can pull from and yes. very commonplace uh, things that would happen to you. So, And what, I'm, what somewhat tears at my heart, and we don't want to be negative Nancy, right? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of great things going on in the Church of Christ. Sure. But one of the areas that we really have to shore up is we're losing, if you'll notice in our early age of Bible classes, they're full. When we get on up to the teenage years, we start having some slippage. Then we go to high school and college, we start losing them. And then it's like, where did all of our young people go? Well, a lot of it simply, it's not that we have not taught them the scripture. I mean, I think that we get an A plus in that area. Most of the time we teach the scripture very well, especially in conservative congregations. But it's like they, they lack the practical abilities to take those steps. And I think it goes back to you have to make certain choices. I mean, if you look at people that are very faithful today, I mean very faithful, think about these four points. What type of job do they have? Who did they marry? Mm-hmm. What are their friends and acquaintances? Or who are their friends and acquaintances? And uh, what was the fourth one? 
Where are they a member? Yeah. yeah where, what congregation they hold membership in. If, if a young man ex- succeeds in those four choices, mm-hmm. now Satan's going to come at him in other areas, yes. But if he succeeds in these four areas, he's going to have the strength and the practical support around him to be able to withstand a lot of those things. But if he, if he doesn't have those choices down, he's putting himself in really a position to fail. In regards to kind of where you worship, I don't know if we're there yet, but I just... No, take off. Let's go. Kind of thinking, you know, you could kind of pair doctrine and where you attend and the type of teaching, the type of preaching, et cetera, that is there. Because I think that's, if you want to take a fifth point, I'm seeing more men, just personal people I know and just existential, fall away. Because the teaching isn't sound. It's not provoking. There's no zeal. There's no edification. I mean... I could just listen, you know, and like you said, we're not trying to be negative Nancys, but we do have to address an we issue. We have to address the issue. If the issue exists. Right. And then let's go to the Bible and let, let's find the help from on high, right? Mm-hmm. Amen. That supplies our strength to move on so that we can do better in the future than we have in the past. Mm-hmm. Nemo. Yeah, and to go off of his point, I think a huge reason why some of those things aren't taught or even addressed is because the leaders in these particular churches or institutions aren't actually following the scriptures to begin with, mm-hmm. and they try to skirt some issues. They try to sugarcoat a few things. They try to make it so that, oh, well, let's get people in here, but we're just wanting to constantly keep people, not so much follow what scripture says. So sometimes people just find a church and they love it, but when they look a little bit closer, it's like, oh, this isn't what I thought it was. It's very shallow, insecure. They're just doing things out of due process, out of due order, and it's not what the scriptures actually say the churches should be following. This is more like an entertainment weekend mm-hmm. versus true biblical doctrine being taught and being practiced. Amen. You know, I like to call it the real deal. In life, there are some things that the copies and the replicas just aren't the same, Madison. Mm-hmm. We want the real deal. And we want to be challenged. And there's nothing wrong with being challenged in our faith under, under godly teaching. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, the Bible says that uh, Paul to Timothy, we are to continue, right, in the doctrine. And in doing so, thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee. We want healthy teaching and teaching that promotes and challenges our thinking to be the best man of God that we can be. If God wants holy men to lead, 1 Timothy 2, 8, and he does, holy men to lead us everywhere, then if we don't, as men, raise up the next generation of young men, there's going to be a void, Mm -hmm. and the entire system of Christianity, you know, is going to suffer. It's going to suffer. Like you said, it's not just the, the, you know, you you, you think in the mind, it's just going to be a handful of people, but you think of all the families that are going to be impacted, you think of the spouses, you think of the children, you think of the generations, you know, on. I mean, that's what we're dealing with right now. If we don't, you know, nip it off at the head, then we do have a real problem on our hands. Yeah. And Caleb, and my thinking is, that, or the scripture actually, you know, like for example, Titus 2.5, older women teach the younger women, right? Mm-hmm. But, but this problem of a lack of masculinity and biblical manhood in our congregations, uh, that's got to be corrected by the men. Yes. Men need to step up and become the leaders of example so that the young men growing up can say, you know what, listen, the world does not have people that, that I want to pattern my life after, but there are godly people right here in the congregation, these men, that, that, that I want to look towards to assist me, and I, and I know that I can be faithful to God and still you know, have a great job. Mm-hmm. I can be faithful to God and have a great marriage. I can be faithful to God, but it's because I've made those decisions that I am where I am. I think some, of, some relation to what Madison was saying and Nemo said is that Men are okay to relinquish some of their responsibility over to others, uh, mainly women in some cases, or just willing to share it instead of uh, understanding the verse where Christ is the head of the church and man is the head of woman, right? It's not a value uh, right. point. It is a godly role definition, and we've forgotten that. And we're just like, here, you can, yeah. you can take this on when we should be able to step up, do what God has for us. Great point. I mean, true liberalism has infected a lot of society even, right? And so, you know, 
there's so many people that are afraid to talk about biblical masculinity because they're thinking, well, you know, how are women going to view that? Well, this is not about value, like you mentioned clearly. The value of a man and a woman are identical in Scripture. They're both made in the image of God. There is no difference or less than attitude between man and woman. The, the issue is, what role has God given us? Mm-hmm. And men are responsible. In Madison, we are going to be responsible for our, you know, for our families and, and our, you know, the congregations and the teaching and, and all of those things. So the only, what, the only thing that we can do to successfully com- combat these things is move immediately uh, towards the Word of God, outlined in Scripture, the very points that will take us to the place that God would be pleased and exit uh, what sometimes has not been working. Mm-hmm. I, I think of when Paul said, mimic me for I mimic Christ. You know, and when we mimic Christ as men, uh, that pretty much elevates us or you know, lowers us to the, meek, the meekest position in that servanthood. You know, a, a strong man who's under complete and total control serving those around him he loves, whether that's in the church, Amen. whether that's the, the downtrodden and the sick, um, whether that's our children, uh, like, you know, kind of going back to why, you know, our occupations and how we steward our time on this earth is very important, but there's so much else at stake right. that isn't mutually exclusive from holding down a job and providing financially. Yes. So You made a great point, and it tied in what Caleb said earlier in Devo tonight. You know, Caleb Zaya lifts weights a little bit, if y'all can tell. Well, <laughs> the, the idea of weightlifting, right, is you're going to have to harness your strength. Well, take that now to the spiritual aspect. How much can a man lift spiritually? How much can a man handle spiritually? Well, the greatest, the greatest testament to a man's spiritual strength is not how much he can lift, how many pounds he can carry. It's how much strength does he have when he can control Mm-hmm. He can control right. all of that strength to the glory of God. So here's Jesus on earth, right? God in the flesh, John 1, 14, all authority, Matthew 20, 18, had the power he could speak anything and it'd be done. And yet he harnessed all of that strength in absolute meekness. And that is the definition. That is the definition of masculinity. I was just thinking of, you know, our Lord asks us, you know, he gives us the, the opportunity to, let go of that burden that he'll choose to carry. He says, my yoke is, is easy, my, or my yoke is light. Um, pretty much meaning, well, b- let me just not go down that road. But what I was trying to say was, if we as men relinquish that burden, yes. and give it over to Christ, Christ has the strength to carry it for us. That's right. Therefore, allowing us to kind of be saturated with his servanthood, so to speak, and like you said, be more effective. But I'm glad you brought that into it because in all these things we're talking about tonight, job, marriage, acquaintances, holding membership. Mm -hmm. If a man does not have the servanthood heart of Christ, he's going to fail because he's not going to be successful in any of these four. And if he's not successful in in any of these four, there's no way he can be faithful to God. There's just no way. There is no such thing as a faithful Christian who is not, and when I say successful, I don't mean without fault. Mm -hmm. Successful means following God's will in that area. You know, if I am, for example, if I'm abusive to my wife, there is no way I'm going to be able to, to come into the house of God, the assembly, mm-hmm. and lead a prayer, no, right? right? I mean, God's not going to hear that prayer. So I've got to be successful in these areas to, to even be uh, a success as a Christian spiritually. And which leads me to that third point tonight, and that is, uh, Caleb, marriage. I mean, how important are y'all? Caleb is single out there. You probably kill me for saying that, but uh, <laughs> he is. But, now, but there's a reason. I mean, seriously, would you just marry anybody? I would not. Tell me how important marriage is to you, and when the time comes, what type of qualities you're going to be looking for in a spouse? Sure. So it's important for me to find someone who holds the same faith as I do, um, the same biblical understanding, the same priorities, or at least we can develop the same priorities. Sure. Um, a Christian, a Christian woman, you might say stereotypically Proverbs. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. 31, 30, the, 31. The virtuous woman. Sure. Yes, Proverbs 31, and it just takes time for some people like myself. But well, there's no problem with that. Hey, yeah. it would be better not to marry than it would be to marry someone 
who is not in keeping with God's teaching. Right. I have known too many people that made a poor decision in a marriage, and it absolutely took them away from the Lord. And again, marriage is not more important than your Christianity. Mm -hmm. But if you choose to marry, then you marry so that your main objective, getting to heaven, pleasing God, right, serving Him all your life, that that will help that. And so many people, I think they try to compartmentalize this, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I can marry anybody I want to marry. I can work anywhere I want to work. I can have any type of friends I want to have. And I can uh, go to any, quote, uh, religious group I want to go to. And yet I'm still going to be over here a really, really faithful, good Christian. And God's going to really be pleased with me. Well, that's not going to happen because you're practically not <clears throat> lining up. It's like we mentioned the night with, with, with the stool. You know, you've got a stool with three legs. Can you imagine one of them is not working? It doesn't matter how good the other two decisions are. This one over here is faulty. Mm -hmm. You've got to make right decisions. It reminds me of 2 Corinthians 6, uh, 14 and surrounding, where it tells us to not be yoked together with unbelievers for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common or what fellowship can light have with darkness, right? If we have two opposites coming together, you and a potential spouse or your current spouse, there, there's going to be a rift there and things can either fall apart or just sure. make it that much more difficult. Sure. You know, and I've known growing up, some people will, you know, overly analyze that and say, well, that doesn't apply to marriage and this and that. But I'm going to tell you the truth. By observation, those people that argue that, many of them are in very bad marriages. Mm -hmm. Amos 3.3 3 makes it plain, and 2 Corinthians 6 makes it plain. Anytime you have two polar opposites, what would be, what would be the, the intimacy? What would be the decision-making? Why would it even prompt you to enter into such a, a, an intimate area of life with someone that's directly opposed to the very fundamental, basic teachings of, of, of Christianity? Yeah. Nemo, yeah. did you have something? Yes, when it comes to marriage, I feel like a lot of people, especially in the church, view marriage as the world sees marriage and not something that is leading them towards Christ. It's just something that they do. They find a girl, they have a relationship, they go dating, and then they may get married, they may not, they may live together, and then, okay, well, I'm done with this person, divorce, move on to the next person. We see that outside of the church, we see that inside of the church, and we had a whole... We had probably several lessons discussing marriages and divorces, but for me as a young man, just seeing that done so poorly, it's very, very hard to find good, strong, biblical marriages to look forward to, to see them, oh, they've been married together, they've stayed together for 50 years, you can see their faith, you can see how they mentor others, they can see how they come alongside younger couples that have recently got married and helped them along. We talk about mentorships. When we're looking for spouses, we should also be looking to those who are married and see what they are doing and ask them, hey, how did you overcome this situation? How did you find out this person? How do we work through this? And actually learn from them before we get married and especially after we do get married. Right. That's an excellent point, Nemo. And, you know, I'm thinking about in the Scripture where, you know, when John the baptizer is going to be uh, brought to this world, you know, God did not just put him with any parents. Mm -hmm. That was no mistake. That was no haphazard accident. He was placed under the care of Zacharias and Elizabeth, mm -hmm. two very God-fearing people. According to Luke chapter 1, 4 and 5, they walked blamelessly in the commandments and ordinances of God. They were righteous people. And so look at the impact that those parents had through the, through the eons of time, the centuries, because of the child that God granted them and what that child grew up to be, the strong man of John the baptizer, who was the predecessor and forerunner to Jesus Christ himself. Mm -hmm. Righteous parents and marriages make a difference. And, and uh, Madison, same way. I mean, what type of qualities are you looking for in a spouse? Well, I mean, I go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting kind of verse 4, as the Bible describes what love is. Okay. And I'm looking for a woman that follows what the Lord has laid out as far as our design is concerned. Um, what is her role? Uh, what is my role? What are the expectations of both parties? Because I don't necessarily have um, just a super subset of rules, but I know one day that me and my spouse are going to stand before the Lord. And I want to make sure that we have both um, done not only what we were supposed to do for one another, 
but what we're supposed to do for God. And so that's what I think about quite a bit is how are we yep. going to, uh, this is going to be a woman who's going to raise your children. This is going to be a woman who's going to steward them when you're not around, who could um, do a, a number of certain things, who's going to be a, a support for you when you might be down. So tons yes. of different things keeping you in the faith. We don't know as men, you know, we're, we're still prone, we're fallible, where you could easily sure. fall. So to be married to the wrong spouse, um, like you said earlier, could easily take us away from the church. And like you said, it, there's nothing more important than our Christianity into getting not only ourselves, but yes. each other to heaven. After we <clears throat> decide to become Christians, the most important decision of our life, the next most important decision is who we marry. Mm -hmm. More so than a job. Jobs come and go. They do. You can change careers. But, but who you marry, because it's such a permanency involved in that, and you're right. Let's say in the course of time, um, after you become a Christian, after, in the course of time that all of a sudden you fall very, you know, very ill, or, or you fall prey to just horrendous amounts of discouragement, or whatever it would be, it would be very unlikely that both spouses at the same time would fall under that deep, dark cloud. And so the other spouse is going to give you and provide you encouragement, right, and admonition, whatever. And so that, that's going to build you up. And that's the kind of spouse you need that is godly so that you can draw from that as a resource when you need it. The only possession, right, besides our souls, the most important possession would be our children. Mm -hmm. Why on earth would anybody want to consummate a marriage, procreate and bring forth children into this dark world, and not even be in agreement on spiritual things? Well, and I think as a man, it gives you also, it gives you assurance in your yes. spouse, because you know where she derives her her strength from, where she derives right. her her personality. Yeah. You know the things that she yes. works on and internally, you can trust that because, like we said earlier, she's she's mimicking God, she's pursuing Christ above all else. And Amen. I, there's no other person that I can trust on this earth than someone. Who and mimics. Proverbs 31 talks about that a you know a husband can safely confide in his wife mm -hmm. because she brings confidence to him. He's secure in in disclosing some of the most secretive things of this life, right, in the refuge of his own bedchambers that he would not go elsewhere for. Mm -hmm. And there's no way he, he would be able to take that to, to a lady that wasn't even, a, you know, a, a faithful Christian. Right. Yeah. Kind of, did you have a comment, Nima? Well, I was just going to say that on continuing with that, the person who you marry will help you in all of those other three major decisions that you make in your life. So, mm -hmm. If you two are in unison, then finding a church won't be as difficult because you're not saying, oh, we need to go here, and then, oh, the spouse was raised Catholic, so we go to a Catholic church. And then when it comes to your children or your circle of friends, you can say, oh, we will have these circle of friends because these are in line with what the Bible says. We're not going to have to fight or determine, okay, well, you can have your friends, I'll have my friends, because we'll be thinking in one mind. And then when Amen. it comes to your job and some of the decisions that you make, because as a family— the man has to make a lot of those decisions, but you want that support from your wife. And how can you be supported if you make a decision that she disagrees with and now you're constantly fighting and going against each other because you don't have that first alignment, which is in Christ? Mm -hmm. Amen. It's that same passage again. It speaks, it's loud, and it's for our learning. Romans 15, 4, for our learning. Listen to it. Amos 3, 3. How can two walk together except they be agreed? Nemo basically, you know, mm -hmm. discussed that particular point right. in right. practical aspects of life. Well, in a house divided cannot stand. Jesus so. said it plainly. Yep. So. so now let's go to the fourth and final one this evening, which I think is crucial. A lot of people, I mean, yeah, now this sounds crazy, Madison. Here we are saying that, okay, ways in which Satan destroys people, especially young men, as they're going towards full manhood, right? Yep. And he stops them dead in their tracks sometimes with their job. Mm -hmm. Sometimes with their marriage, sometimes with their friends and acquaintances, poor choices. And this fourth one seems crazy, but it's true. Sometimes he utilizes a poor choice in where they hold membership mm -hmm. religiously. So it's not enough. I mean, we know the Bible teaches the one church, right. but we're not talking about just being a member of the Church of Christ. We're talking about being a member of one of the congregations of the Church of Christ, Romans 16, 16, that is that is trying their dead level best to stay true to the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And there's a conviction there. We all make some mistakes. I've made some, you've made some, you've made, right? We all make some mistakes. But there is, a, there is a true conviction 
that we're going to serve God and we're going to challenge all of ourselves the teaching of God's Word and we're not going to shy away from things and we're not going to come here to just be entertained. This is the real deal. We're committed to it and we know that placing membership in a congregation that's faithful is very important. Amen. I think you hit it on the head. It's First and foremost, we're here to serve God. You know, He's the one who breathed life into us. He's the one who provided salvation for us. He's provided the church. You know, Christ purchased it with His blood. He's, uh, I mean... I could just keep going on and on. I just gush at the, you know, all the things that God's provided for us. But, you know, I, I want to talk especially to young men. You need to be very, very deliberate and diligent when you begin to pick a church. And I know some of you might be younger, but you need to be having that on the forefront of your mind now because as you begin to make that choice, that's one of the preliminary choices you need to make prior to marrying a spouse, prior to uh, maybe even securing a job. Because like we said earlier, yes. where you worship is going to determine how you serve God, how you view God. Um, the, the manners in which you, uh, the order in which you worship. I mean, right. tons of um, things can derail you. It's going to show you what an elder looks like. It's going to show you how deacons work and, and the capacity of an evangelist and tons of knowledge that a man needs to have yes. uh, coming up. Yeah, I think it will also provide, whether at that time, depending on your age, right? You said elders, deacons, but there's also other areas for leadership opportunities You've mentioned mentors. There's plenty of room for that. Yes. Uh, if, if you're older and you don't want to be an elder, you can mentor someone younger. Or right. if you are able to just do a service around the building, if you're able to help someone in some way, you are serving for that church. Amen. You, you made a great point, Caleb. There's a handful of young men that we got here that can easily serve in the capacity of song leading. That's something God gave them a voice. They can lead song. They can um, help maybe usher people in. There, there's tons of... of Lord's Supper table. They can make excellent talks yes. on the table. We have widows who can be... I mean, there's just so many... There's, there's such a, a, a need and a capacity for servants. And these young men need to develop this at this young age to kind of walk in their, their uh, the, themselves, if you will, because... That's why I think we see so many problems, kind of like you said, yes. liberalism creeping in. Here is one thing that an older guy told me one time I thought was a really good point. He said, here's how you can tell if a church is healthy. Or, well, one, one read, you know, there's many others, but this is one key. He says, if the preacher, let's say he had to be gone for a couple of months. Mm-hmm. He, w- he was gravely ill or he had, you know, whatever it was. He, he could not be there a couple of months. If that congregation cannot, with its men, continue to operate right in-house. Now, there's nothing wrong with calling an outside guy. I don't mean that. But it should be the case that the men of that congregation can operate, stand up, and just keep going and never miss a beat. Amen. Because part of the evangelist's job is to help in the training, right? Mm-hmm. So if, if, if a congregation is healthy, like here, you know, if I had to be gone Sunday, I mean, you can preach. If I have to be gone Sunday, you can preach. Mm-hmm. If I have to be gone, Nemo can preach. You know, Christian can preach. I mean, actually, we have a lot of young men here, and I know you guys haven't been to, quote, preaching school, but I'm going to tell you the truth. And some of you, I did. and uh, the people of the congregation here would amen this. A lot of these young men here can preach just as well as some, <laughs> as some ripe old preachers. Mm-hmm. So don't ever underestimate yourself. It's not about a school. It's at first about giving your heart to God and immersing yourself in prayer and the Word of God and getting behind Get, getting behind it with great commitment and God bless in such a way as it's not tied to a school. It's tied to our hearts and commitment to God. Nemo? Yeah, what you just said is actually something that is really important that I've noticed here at Deer Creek because with my background, there was always paid members from the denominations that would always handle everything, but you never actually saw individuals in the congregation get to step up and fulfill a role. It was always someone who was paid to do it. So when I started attending here and eventually placed membership, I was asked to start serving. And sure, other churches have people to serve, but this was a more intentional say, hey, you're going to go do this because this will help you fulfill your obligation to walk in Christ, to help you with this church, and then just even thinking about this broadcast, we couldn't do this here today if it wasn't for people saying, hey, we want you to go do this because I think you have a gift in this area. We need you to fulfill that obligation to learn and to grow. And then when you also think about how even like tonight where we have different people here on the broadcast, that is just a catalyst for more 
things to grow, for more people to do things in that. Mm -hmm. There's always areas to serve. And then, like you mentioned, when you have a church where people aren't stepping up, when people aren't serving, those typically will die away because there's no one to fulfill those roles. And that's, again, going back to what we said previously, where too many people just pass on the obligation to someone else. They just decide, oh, I can't do this. We need members of the church to actually call out those and say, hey, you need to step up and serve, and then people to also answer that call and follow through. Yes, I mean, we have to actually become addicted to service. Mm -hmm. And that's the exact word that the Pauline uh, epistle to the church at Corinth utilized in chapter 16, verse 15. And they were addicted to the ministry uh, of the saints. Now, in that particular <coughs> passage, it was talking about benevolence, but the concept of the same, men must serve. And it's not that merely we're obligated, we are, but it's more than that. It becomes a passion, a way of life. It, it's who we are, right? Mm -hmm. We're men of God, and that's what we do. We love God, we love people, and we understand that in every area of our life, it's a job, if it's at the house with our wife and children, if it's in the worship, 1 Timothy 2, wherever it's at, that we are going to do everything within our power to be men of integrity, honor, committed to God above everything else. Mm -hmm. Well, you just mentioned earlier in 1 Corinthians 16, if you just drop down, and you said 16, 15, if you drop down to, to verse 16, the last word you use is laboreth. So we're, we're men that are working. We're, we're setting the example for right. not just ourselves. We're not uh, setting the status quo, so to speak, but we're also setting the example uh, for younger men. And, you know, if you come to Deer Creek at some point or another and you're male, you're going to be asked to serve in, in some form of capacity because that's just how right. we operate. We are doing our best to train people up in service of the Lord in the, in the, in the active, not the passive. And everybody has to have skin in the game, mm -hmm. right? You have to be invested in the work if the work means anything to you. Yes. And so... You know, I think these are some good discussions, and we hope if you're watching tonight, um, actually uh, let us know on the thread, because if you're interested in more of these practical points, then we want you to let us know and tell us some of the things that you want to hear about. There's nothing off the table that we won't discuss. We want to use the Bible and try to help people. Yeah. Madison, it's always our custom here on what set the Scripture, always to tell people how to become a Christian before we close this broadcast, because there could be people watching tonight that have never even heard the things that we're discussing, and, and here we are getting down the very details of things. They're, they're asking, well, what would I do to be saved to begin with? How can I be right with God? And that's what I think we ought to finish with this evening. Sure. The first thing I would, you know, would discuss when we're talking about salvation is we have to hear the Word of God first and foremost. Yes. And I mean what the Scripture says, not what man says. So that would be the first thing I would encourage anybody who's inquiring about salvation or just may not be sure with the things in life that's going on, but we have to hear the Word of God be preached and to be taught. And that's why we're here tonight, Romans 10, how shall they hear without a preacher? Mm -hmm. Three preachers. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, Romans 10 and 17, right? And the Word of God then produces what? The Word of God produces faith, right? Now, listen, it doesn't say everyone that reads the Word of God has faith. Mm -hmm. It says that all faith comes from the Word of God. Many people read it and never obtain faith. But you've got to read it with the right mindset, with a deliberate pursuit to receive. Right. Asking, you shall receive. We want faith, and we are blessed with faith because God's Word supplies it. Mm -hmm. But you can only receive what you're asking for. And that's right. If anyone wants to become a Christian tonight, he has to have his ears tuned to the Holy Spirit's message, which is recorded in the Bible. What did the Spirit say about salvation? Yes, he said through the words of Paul, you must hear the gospel. Well, what is the gospel, Madison? The gospel is, by definition, the good news. It's the good news that we have a Savior, that we have remission of sin. You know, I was reading in uh, Acts chapter 8 the other day, just kind of kind of just doing a, a, just a small study in Acts, sure. and I was just fascinated by... Philip's teaching of the gospel in Samaria when he was just uh, men and women both were being baptized, but the prerequisite to that baptism was belief. Yes. So I thought, I thought that was so interesting, and there's a couple other records, but uh, we have to believe yes. the gospel, uh, the good news of Jesus Christ is kind of the second. Man, I'm so thankful. Can you imagine all sinners of the world 
We're blessed of the death of Jesus Christ, Amen. the good news. That's why we're here tonight. It is good news. The world is negative. The world is polarizing. The world is filled and saturated with wickedness, 1 John 5, 19. Mm -hmm. But praise be to God, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel is good news. Amen. I think it's also important to remember that once we hear, we investigate on our own. Yes. We believe we make that confession, and we have to obey what the gospel yeah. says, right? Going back to Acts 8, the Ethiopian eunuch, he saw the water, and he said, why shouldn't I be baptized, right? Yeah. He took the initiative to obey the gospel to his own benefit. Yeah, he's searching. He's asking. Can you imagine? They're riding in this chariot. He's on his way home from Jerusalem, right? He's headed back home. And he's riding in a chariot, and they're having this conversation. And he says, look, see, here's water. What doth hindereth me? What keeps me from being baptized? And Philip said plainly, if thou believest, and you're correct, belief precedes baptism. God's made it pretty easy. He's made it, he's made it very easy to understand the gospel. Right. I suppose the most difficult part of salvation is, you know, not hearing, not believing, but it's repenting mm -hmm. because repentance demands an absolute change of the heart that manifests itself on the outside eventually, but it's a change of direction. And Jesus himself said, unless we repent, we'll likewise perish with 13 and three. And, and Caleb hit the nail on the head because after we repent, we're not through. We have to confess with the mouth, he's the son of God. And then like the eunuch, be baptized in water so that we can receive the forgiveness of our sins, Acts 2 and verse number 38. We need more men of God in the churches of Christ. We're asking you, beseeching you this evening, think about becoming a New Testament Christian. We need more men enlisted in the Lord's church to help us in the greatest fight that the world has ever known, mm -hmm. the fight between good and evil. Paul said he had kept the faith. He had finished the course, and he had fought the fight. We need more people to join with us, to help us in the fighting of the wickedness that is all around us, Madison. Mm -hmm. So I suppose, have y'all heard lately at work and everywhere else around, there is a question that everybody is starting to ask. Y'all know what that is? I think I so. I think I have an idea. Based on Romans 4 and 3. What, what saith the, the scriptures? scriptures? 